Section 14 of The Age of Anne by Edward Ellis Morris. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 14, Fag End of the War. Of the two men who were now the leading advisers of the Queen and acknowledged chiefs of the Tory party, Harley was in the higher position, though Bolingbroke was really the abler man. Robert Harley belonged to a Whig family. His father had even been put in prison on suspicion of being implicated in Monmouth's conspiracy. Entering Parliament for a Cornish borough immediately after the Revolution, Harley was very strongly opposed to the Tory party, which he afterwards joined. In William's reign he was elected Speaker of the House of Commons. When Godolphin was dismissed, his place as Lord High Treasurer was at first not filled up. The office was put in commission, and Harley was appointed Chancellor of the Exchequer, but was practically Prime Minister. Harley was neither eloquent nor a man of genius, but he possessed powers which have sometimes availed more than eloquence or genius, the arts of a courtier. He was more at home in the Queen's antechambers than in either house of Parliament. He was ambitious, unscrupulous, strong in worldly wisdom. An event which nearly cost him his life had the effect of increasing his popularity. A French refugee who called himself the Marquis of Giscard had made frequent proposals for descents upon the coast of France. Afterwards he had carried on intrigues with France. He was arrested and under examination before the council when he suddenly seized a penknife from the table and stabbed Harley with it. A scuffle ensued in which the Frenchman was mortally wounded, and it was then found that Harley's wound was but slight. Great sympathy was expressed for Harley, and shortly afterwards the Queen made him an earl, with the double title Oxford and Mortimer. She then raised him to the office of Lord High Treasurer. Henry St. John was a man of very different character. In that age, famous for its wits and its literary men, he could hold his own with any of them. He was very intimate with the chief authors of the day, especially with Pope and Swift, and the poet diplomatist Matthew Pryor. He was an accomplished classical scholar, very eloquent, and renowned as an elegant writer. As a politician he was distrusted, and could never have kept his party together. He was brilliant rather than safe. As a writer he was very hostile to Christianity. It was nearly a year later than Harley's promotion that St. John was elevated to the peerage, and he was then only made a Viscount. His title was Viscount Bolingbroke. It is said that this inequality of rewards led to ill-will between these members of the same government. It is probable that from their first acceptance of office they intended to put an end to the war, but they could not well publicly declare this intention and whilst they were still feeling their way, an event occurred which promised to provide them with an excellent excuse. The Emperor Joseph died, and his brother, the Archduke Charles, after due formality of an election and a delay of nearly six months, succeeded him as Emperor, so that it now became doubtful whether it would be in accordance with the views of the Allies to continue a war which had been begun nominally in order to win him the crown of Spain but such a feeling was gradual, not immediate. In order to secure the election at Frankfurt from any fear of a French invasion, Eugène received orders from Vienna to withdraw with all his troops from the army under Marlborough in Flanders. Villars, the French marshal, had fortified his position with great care, and boasted that Marlborough could not pass into France. He called his lines the non plus ultra. Marlborough, however, although the Allied forces were weakened by Eugène's withdrawal, entered the nonplus ultra with ease. He then laid siege to Bouchain and captured it. But these were the only military achievements of the Allies during the year 1711. Coming events were already casting their shadows before. The ministers planned an expedition against Quebec and entrusted the command of it to Colonel Hill, the brother of Mrs. Masham, the Queen's favorite. It was thought that if this expedition was successful, it would act as a counterpoise to the great achievements of Marlborough. 
but the fleet of transports were badly provided with supplies and had great difficulties in procuring pilots skilled in the navigation of the dangerous seas at the mouth of the st lawrence unfortunately it met with a violent storm and several of the ships were wrecked the result was that the expedition returned to england a failure meanwhile negotiations had been secretly opened with france as the ministers had determined on peace in concert with the allies if the allies preferred if not without them and upon terms as favourable for themselves as possible but the consideration of terms was not to be allowed to stand in the way of peace one obstacle it was necessary to remove the great general who had won four great battles for the cause who had never besieged a town without taking it who had been the heart and spirit of the alliance must be sacrificed to break the blow the queen did him the honour of writing a letter with her own hand dismissing him from all his employments the reason alleged was that an accusation had been made against him that he had taken perquisites from a jew who had contracted to supply the army with bread and that during the ten years this allowance amounted to the sum of sixty three thousand pounds there was also a charge that marlborough had deducted two and a half per cent from the pay which england gave to foreign troops and that this amounted in the ten years to no less than one hundred and seventy seven thousand pounds his letter of reply was very dignified he made answer first that the payments were quite according to precedent and secondly that he had taken the money not for his private use but to obtain secret intelligence about the enemy there can be no doubt that this defence is perfectly satisfactory but his opponents were bent on his disgrace prince eugene hastened to england to endeavour to prevent its falling away from the alliance he was received with all civility and even cordiality but no representations that he could make could have any effect in reinstating his old companion in arms within a year of marlborough's disgrace his old friend and colleague godolphin died at his house partly from sorrow partly because of the unpopularity into which he had now fallen marlborough went abroad the ministers being determined to have a majority in both houses of parliament strained the royal prerogative and induced the queen to make twelve peers some were eldest sons of peers who would have become peers in the course of nature two were prominent lawyers one of them was mr masham all of course were tories when they appeared in the house an opponent alluding to their number asked sarcastically whether they voted separately or by their foreman meanwhile the duke of ormond was appointed to an unpleasant post it was difficult enough to succeed marlborough as commander-in-chief but it must have been absolutely humiliating for him to hold that office and yet to receive secret orders tying his hands and bidding him to do nothing a general of straw he was called as no one likes to be a dummy the duke must have found it a positive relief when an armistice between the english and the french was declared he received orders to separate the troops in the pay of england from the army of the allies but many of these troops acting under orders from their own governments refused to obey and he withdrew with the native english soldiers eyewitnesses have described the indignation with which the english soldiers and officers received the orders and the shame with which they parted from their former comrades on so many fields ormond was followed by only twelve thousand soldiers the smallness of this number points to the fact that england had been fighting in this war with money rather than with men the number of native british soldiers was very small compared with the number of foreign mercenaries that england paid hessians palatines and germans of other small states especially in the rhine valley where a century of wars beginning with the terrible thirty years war had ruined their homes and implanted in their breasts the love of a military life notwithstanding the departure of the english troops eugene was still at the head of an army of one hundred thousand men in an excellent position his lines were called the road to paris because it seemed that when once he had taken Londrecy, 
a town which he was besieging, nothing could stop him from entering France. General alarm was felt in that country, and the king wrote to Marshal Villars that he trusted all to him, but that if defeat should await him, he himself would mass all his troops, and at their head, perish or save the state. It is curious that King Louis should have thought such extreme language necessary when the alliance was breaking up, and deliverance was so near. Eugène's lines were so widely extended that if one part were attacked, it could not quickly receive succor from another. Villars made a feigned attack on Eugène's camp before Landrecy, and then, hurling all his strength upon Denain, there won a brilliant victory on July 24, 1712. It is said that Eugène himself came up in time to witness, but not to stop the defeat. There can be no doubt that this battle had a great influence in determining the Dutch to make peace. They saw that with the English troops victory had departed. Eugène was compelled to raise the siege of Landrecy, and Villars retook three towns from the Allies, one of them being Bouchain, the sole conquest of the previous year. End of section 14